welcome to the queue. My name is Gummy, and today we have Alex Cano. So, Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am originally from Laredo. Um, I graduated from United South High School, and through my very long journey, I was I've been in communications for the past 15 to 17 years. I started in radio and then eventually I went into TV journalism and right now I am currently the assistant news director for KGNS. Um, we are under the umbrella of Gray Television and it is one of the largest growing TV news stations and outlets in the country. Um, I know that we are expanding very, very, very fast and we are currently working on leaving our station where we're at on Del Mar and we are going to be moving to uh, Loop 20, um, the old former Univision station. Okay, yes. So yes. that building has been bought out by Gray TV, and that will be our new uh, KGNS TV Telemundo, KGNS Plus station. That's cool, though, yeah. I've always remembered KGNS being in the same location all this time. Yeah, it's growing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're in high school. You're... Uh, probably listen to like Matchbox 20 or something. Are you dreaming about being in communications? I was very, very, very shy. I, when I was in high school, before that, I, I wasn't really looking into being into public speaking. I was so shy that I remember that I was in UIL at the time, maybe probably, I, I was going through a health scare when I was about 14, 15. And so I missed a lot of my ninth grade year. And because of that, I didn't have the friendships that you develop your first year in high yeah. school, you know. And so for me, that was really hard. For me, was trying to catch up to where everyone were, was already at. They had their, you know, cliques, you had their groups and everything. And so high school for me was a little bit different, too, because I had been in private school um, and not because I came from anyone influential or anything like that. But I had gotten a scholarship with uh, the Diocese of Corpus Christi at the time. So I was I, I was born in Laredo but raised in Corpus and my parents put me and my sister in private school and they used to cut the grass for the church and stuff like that. And so it was always the same uh, people that you saw from elementary all the way to middle school. And for me to go into high school with so many different kids, so many different teachers, it was just a lot. And going into high school for me, I, I was very sheltered, very, very, very shelled in, shocked. And uh, my teacher, my English teacher at the time said, you know, you really should get out of your shell. I couldn't even read in, in class. I was so painfully shy. I remember that, that I hated reading in class in front of everyone. Public speaking was not my thing. I wasn't even thinking about that. I didn't even know what I wanted to be in high school. I mean, after high school, I didn't even want, know what I was going to study I thought I was going to do business and because my family had had businesses in the past but you know my dad got sick and we lost a lot of things so that's why there's a lot of things that 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 came into play before my high school years and so he encouraged me to do UIL prose and poetry okay. and it was simply because whenever I would read out loud my face was red I mean we were talking about cherry beyond red tomato and I just couldn't get at, get out of that and so that was the first experience that I had with public speaking and it was pushing for my teacher he said you need to get out of your shell and he we would go to UIL competitions and there was only six people sometimes in that classroom to to compete against and I would yeah. still be shy and so slowly but surely I said okay maybe Maybe, maybe this is what I like to do. Maybe I want to want to speak. I want to do something in communication. I didn't know what it was, and I wasn't sure where I was going to go with it. But for sure, I knew that I liked what I what came out of it. You know, sometimes when I would do public speaking, and maybe the poem that I was reading came out right. I'm not sure. I that, I think it was maybe my senior year that I got for the first time in maybe three years or two years that I placed at all. And so I said, okay, maybe there's something to this. And, uh, let's see where it goes. And then when I got to college, um, I, again, fell back into the shyness. 
and I said, you know what, let me let me move my field. Let me just get out of that and let me see not taking business, but maybe communications and see where it goes. And through that, um, I was able to get uh, an internship, a class for okay. at that time in Tammy U. There was um, uh, there was a course for journalism and there was also TV and radio. And I mean, this was probably 2009. And I went to every radio station that we had at that time. And this is before we had, you know, Sirius XM has always been around, but this is before every other car had Sirius XM. Okay. And so people were still kind of still listening to the radio back mm-hmm. in the day. And I remember I went to every radio station and everyone said, no, we don't like your voice. We don't like your presentation. We don't have time. I went to, at that time here in Laredo, there was maybe four or five radio stations. And then you had your little pirate radio stations. And then you had yeah. your little <laughs> Mexican radio stations. Yeah. And so I said, oh, let me go to them. And finally got I got to one that um, there was a guy doing a morning show. And he said, well, you know, I, I need a co-host. And let's see, are you willing to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning? I said, oh. Sure, <laughs> go for it. I'll do that. And he had kind of this whole, I don't know if the listeners know or not, but who Howard Stern is. <laughs> yeah. But he had that kind of concept. You know, he has Robin Quivers and, you know, Howard Stern. He had obviously all these other co hosts. And so yeah. that was his concept of his show. That's what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I was supposed to be the serious one because. <laughs> I I mean I didn't I didn't know what else to do except read the news and he would you know obviously tell me give me pointers hey your voice you sound way too loud way too squeaky but even to that I I, I was always really 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 nervous and so that was my introduction but from high school to that moment I know I know when you even just to speak in public f- for whatever reason it can be very nerve-wracking you know and especially like i don't know i mean did you was anxiety ever a part of that or 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 like how did you get over that though you know i haven't i still go through it because now my job is to teach people that are going into the journalism business of how to not have it and so the way i cope with it i say okay just you know Focus on the day. Focus on what you're, what what what's what's in hand. You know, people are not going to pay attention to what you're. They don't know about you. You know, they don't know. Yeah. They they will tune out. You know, th- as much focus as you think people are paying attention, they're not. I've had so many mentors in the last fifteen to seventeen years that tell me, you need to just speak slower, take pauses. You know, whenever you're in public and the way I still cope, to, you know, with anxiety is sometimes there's little triggers that I know are going to be an issue for me. For example, if I drink a lot of coffee, you know, <laughs> you know, if I, if I know I'm going to have to go on live TV, I don't drink coffee that day because I know my my blood pressure, everything, you know, the countdown three, two, one, and then you're on. So I, I make sure I don't have have that. But I also make time for myself where I don't pay attention to social media or find distractions because everything is a distraction Mm -hmm. and so I kind of do little pauses here and there and now I have a counselor I go and do you know I have a counselor that helps me cope with and do different exercises but I wish I had that back in the day but I used to go through a lot of anxiety panic attacks I even had a panic attack when I um, was a reporter in Waco and it was, in, in that demographic, it was 5 million people. You know, you're talking about 20 yeah. little cities. And this is c- central Texas, you know. And so I remember I was on the side of a highway. And it was by myself. I had the camera. This was when I was a reporter a couple of years ago. And I, all I could hear was the 18-wheelers. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, what if they don't, what if they miss me? What if I, what if one of them ends up crashing into me? And so I just remember when I heard through my IFE, which is where you could hear, it's kind of like a headphone that you use for TV, and you can hear what the director's telling you, like, hey, you're about to be on live TV in three, 
to one, I just couldn't, I didn't know what to say. And I was very, very, very panicked. And so then my producer told me, okay, calm down. We'll take video. Okay, I won't be on TV. I won't, they won't show my face, you know, speak. And so in, 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 I attribute those panic attacks because I wanted to do everything. Everything was a distraction to me, you know. I wanted to see what people were saying on on Facebook Live. I wanted to see what people were saying on Twitter. Like there was just so much, and slowly but surely, again, I have little triggers here and there. And when I know I'm about to be on live TV or do something, then I just make sure that I don't attribute to that. So sometimes I'm not answering phone calls, I'm not answering messages, I'm not on whatever app, so I can just be focused. But also, counseling has helped me recently would deal with other things that are happening in my life so let me ask you this though when you i mean you're in high school Mm -hmm. you don't you don't really don't have any experience in public speaking you're terrified of it in fact all of a sudden you're in front of a camera with a microphone you know reporting the news how are you feeling at that time like besides the anxiety like are you as what i mean is are you proud of yourself as to see how, like, as n- seeing how far you've gone at that point? I I feel very, very proud of myself in different ways because I I was always told that I wasn't gonna make it. Yeah. I was always told that. I was always told by someone, whether it's family, friends, yeah. so called friends. Mm-hmm. You know, I even had a teacher at one point that told me they're like, it's because. I don't know how you're going to do it, Mija. You're, you know, you can't even speak loud. And so I did it at the beginning. I pushed my anxiety aside, you know, and, uh, out of anger to prove to someone that I was going to do it. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. and that's uh, my anger took me so far. But then after your 20s, you start feeling different. And then now in your mid 30s, I'm in my mid 30s. And so now I've after suppressing all my anxiety and panic after so many years, n- you know, now I'm like, okay, it's, it's okay to have someone to talk to. So that's why I decided to go to a counselor, yeah. you know, and, and I encourage people to have someone to reach out to help for sure, for sure. Especially if you're in a high stress job, because as much as your friends or family have the best intentions of helping you, mm-hmm. you know, th- it's better to get outside help. To give you a new perspective. Yes. So uh, being in this industry where everything's so fast and you can mm-hmm. get sued and you can get in yeah. trouble. <laughs> and every day is, every, you know, being a, a reporter, every day is something new. So I went from from uh, radio into TV news and it's two different things. So when I took the leap for TV news, I didn't know what I was doing. And that was a whole set of anxiety. Like that was a whole level. Yeah. And I was not prepared for that. And I felt extremely anxious, scared, overwhelmed. I remember going into work and just feeling like I was going to throw up every other day. Yeah. You know, and that's what it is. And and now, so long into it, now I understand that there are ways to cope with it. You know, the triggers for me and anxiety is, again, a lot of social media, what I eat contributes yeah. to that you know um my state of mind if i have a bad day how do i just make sure that i'm not going to take it into my work you know and now that i'm managing reporters some of these reporters are very very fresh they come from out of town they don't know laredo you know yeah. they come from from out of state they're leaving their families behind young 20 22 years old so i take the role and i say okay let me help you how do you feel today Ah, it's because, you know, I have to report on this trial about a murder and I see all these things, but I miss my mom and, you know, I know they're 20, 20, 22, but it doesn't matter. You know, you're thousands of miles away from home. I'm like, okay, take, take your break, take lunch. I wish, you know, take your break, take lunch and, and let's focus again when you come back. I wish someone would have had that when I was into entering the business. So you're basically a, like a counselor to them also. <laughs> Yeah, in a way. I call them my kids. I don't have yeah. children, but they are my <laughs> kids. You know, they yeah. are my kids. And so, but it, I know how it feels like when you don't have 
the guidance at the beginning. And then when I had the guidance, I had some great mentors in my mid-20s that helped me cope with everything. But when I was in high school, I just, and I, and I, and I took that with me into college, and I took that with me in my career. I wanted to prove to people wrong that they said that I couldn't do it, and I, I didn't deal with the anxiety and the stress and the panic that I had from that early age. And yes. And now again, you know, now I understand things a little bit differently, and that's what I take into my kids now. So, at the station, it's obviously Jerry, my boss, Jerry Garza, and then. You know, I work under him, and I'm his assistant, but I'm assisting with the daily news, too. But my job is to make sure that these kids, the reporters, get to where they're at, but also make sure that they want to stay in the business because yeah. people leave. As a reporter, you leave. You, they leave maybe two or three years into it. It's too much. Every day, you're doing something new. The workload, it's a lot. Yeah. You know, and I want them to stay long-term. And... The best way to do it is to understand them, and that is what I, what I hope they they see now when I go into work. But yes, it all began in high school, and it, it all began because of shyness and that. And that's why, to me, it's impressive that you know you started off as somebody, a teenager, you know, who for the most part, I mean, I see hundreds of them every day, and and a lot of them don't say anything; they don't speak. They either because they think they don't have a voice or or they're just afraid. Like there's that social anxiety, you know, what if I say something wrong and they make fun of me or something? Adults have that, too. You know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily go away. But I think part of that is also like the confidence that you that you get from, you know. And usually it's the confidence that you get from from other people, you know, that, that start seeing they believe in you and and. Like you, you, you went through the, um, through rejection, you know, and, uh, I mean, nobody likes reject rejection, right? But you went through, you, you know, you rejected quite a, quite a bit, you know, on the, for radio, as you said. And television too. So, and I mean, and, and television is worse in my opinion, because I had a list of, you know, your face or your hair, or your figure, or your weight, or your eyes, or your writing. So it wasn't even it wasn't even the judging or the 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 critique on my physique. It was also the critique on my writing and my voice. So you kind of go home and you think to yourself, so what? How do I? What do I do? Where do I go? You know. And I remember there was this one time that I had uh, someone tell me this whole, this long, long letter from from my w one of the stations I worked at, and they s it was a viewer that said, you know, you should really consider quitting. If I were you, if I were you, I would consider quitting and do something else. Like, it was just this long letter, and it was one after the other after the other. And I remember calling, and I had, my dad had just recently passed away, and I had called my mom and I said, you know what, mom, I think after so many years of doing this, I think I'm ready to come home. You know, I think I'm ready of just coming home. This is too much for me. You know, I'm, I'm about to turn 30 at that time. <laughs> I'm about to turn 30 and I can't take people just saying all these things. And then she said to me, do you believe it? And I told her, I don't know. She's like, do you believe, do you believe what they're telling you? And I said, well, it must be true if I get the same amount of people telling me that. She's like, look, work on your craft. You know, wh why did you want to get into, you know, radio or television? Why did you want to do it? I said, because I wanted to do story. I wanted to, you know, write stories of people that matter. She's like, okay, focus on that. And I kid you not, I know it sounds so simple, but the moment I started focusing on the people I was interviewing rather than just, oh, poor me, I think it made a switch in my mind, but yeah. also it didn't fix the issue. It kind of lingered for years. Mm -hmm. And so I know that for me, I, I, I put all my stress into work and, but there was always this little, you know, like, what if, what if I'm not doing enough? And so now what I tell my reporters is, how do you feel today? You know, tell me, tell me, Tell me, do you believe, because sometimes they get letters or they get emails from viewers that tell them, oh my gosh, your voice, or you <laughs> sounded horrible, your writing yeah. is, you know, you know, a certain type of way. And I said, do you believe it? 
was like, well, you know, maybe I don't, I don't, I don't know if I should keep on doing this. I'm like, well, take this opportunity to improve. Let's, let's go over it. Let's look at the story. Maybe you said something that wasn't correct. You know, let's kind of go over it. So I, I feel that over time I've been able to figure myself out and with that being, be able to help my, my reporters, but yeah it's always something that that comes whether it was radio or television you know if you if you take the route to journalism you're always going to get criticized one way or another and everyone says well have a tough you know thick skin it's you can have the thickest <laughs> skin in the world but it's always going to hurt when strangers that don't know you tell mm-hmm. you things yes but my mom always used to say too she's like are they paying your bills like do you know them then you shouldn't care. And, I, you know, it's, it's lovely when your parents tell you certain things, but, you know, you start believing it over, over yeah. time. And that's kind of what I was getting to, like, the because a lot of times when, you know, you, you kind of, you reach a certain level of success, success in your career, uh, in whatever field that you're in, and um, people start doubting themselves. Like, do they, kind of like the imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. right? Like, do, do I really belong here mm-hmm. and stuff? Even though you've already been in it, in the industry for years, you know, sometimes you get that. What would you tell people, like, regardless of whatever field they're going to get into or career, you know, if they're suffering from anxiety or any mental health issue for that matter, what's the most important thing they can do to kind of get over that stump? I think they need to recognize it. I think that if the worst thing you can do is ignore it, I feel like that was my biggest mistake you want to ignore it, suppress it, do other things, hurt other people, take advantage of, you know, yourself and do other things. But you should really sit down and say, okay, I have a problem. You know, I, I wake up stressed to do this job. Is it, or I'm stressed to go to school or I'm stressed to go to work. If you can't talk to your family about this, try to see if there's a friend. If there, you can't talk to a friend about this, you know, we're very lucky now that we have access to help here locally. There's a lot of organizations that have a lot of people that you can talk to. And I don't know if it's a generational thing or not, but when when I was growing up, I didn't have that. But you have all these great organizations, Pillar, SCAN, yeah. you know, that know, and even the districts even have counselors or someone assigned, you know. And so find the help now before it gets worse and but again you have to recognize it say hey i don't feel good today and this is what i'm feeling you know and if you can't trust your inner circle you have to be strong enough to say i need to find help and it all begins with you and and admitting it the moment you don't admit it there's it's kind of like a domino effect it keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing yeah, and I can see that because uh, I know one of the things that I always tell whoever I'm talking to, if we're talking about relationships, for, for example, it's being honest with yourself, which a lot of people aren't. You know, they 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 put on this fake persona, you know, like an alter ego almost. And and uh, like I did that for years. It wasn't until I be, w- started becoming honest with myself that I started to kind of grow as a person and realizing, you know, whatever potential I had and kind of focusing on what I wanted to do. But it's very true, yeah, like, you know, being, uh, recognizing what, what uh, like, who you are, whatever issues you have, and then dealing with them mm-hmm. and, and facing them. Because, like, you faced your fears, you know, you, you still did the reporting, you still were on in front, in front of the camera, you were still on the radio, despite people like yes. you know basically crapping on you, right? Yes. You know? <laughs> and you still did it, you know, and you still you know overcame all that. Probably a question that you don't get often, but to Alex Gano, what does happiness mean to you? I think happiness for me means, and it and it sounds so, it's gonna sound so strange. Happiness to me means that. If I can go to work or I can wake up and I don't feel stressed or I don't feel, I feel accomplished in something, that's what happiness means to me. For example, 
just right now, I, I left work, and I was talking to some of my new crew, and they had just finished the trial. And it was a horrible trial to begin with. You know, it was a lot of, you know, it's, it was very, very, very explicit, the trial. It was a, a murder trial that we covered. And, you know, m one of the guys that, that I assigned to cover the case, I to he said, you know what, Alex? I'm really grateful that you gave me the opportunity to go see this, you know, to sit down and, you know, know how to note take a trial and everything. And he's like, I, I thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. So that means, that gives me happiness to know that I was able to help someone understand or do something new. You know, for me, that makes me feel happy when I help someone else accomplish their goals and their dreams. And, and I know it's kind of, well, you know, what is it for me? itself but it, it brings me joy it brings me joy that I contribute a little bit to their success or their day that's what brings me peace and happiness mm -hmm. I like w I like seeing other people accomplish yeah. what they want and I don't know it's fulfilling in some way it gives me a purpose because I, I think I was so long not knowing what my purpose was in life you know I said am I a radio DJ am I a TV news am I do I want to become an anchor do I, what do I want to do you know do I want to write a book like what <laughs> what is it and so my I finally realized at this stage of my life that my purpose is to guide people that were equally lost or were at a stage where I was where a lot of people told them you you're never gonna make it <laughs> like, yeah you know you're never gonna make it but that's where that's where I am right now and that's what gives me peace and makes me happy and whether it's family, friends, coworkers, whatever, you know, seeing that I contribute a little bit to their lives makes me feel happy. Yeah. Well, because I mean, because you've been through it, you know, you've been through, through, through your ups and downs, your own ups and downs, your own um, heartbreaks and, and so now you want to give back to people who, who may be in the same position that you were in the past. This is what I what I what I like when I talk to people that once they recognize like what who they are as a person, that they don't mind sharing their experiences, where as tragic as they may be or as positive as they may be, because it's it's a teaching experience. It's a it's a teaching moment where you can tell people this is how what I went through. This is how I overcame it. It may not necessarily be the same for every single person that you tell it to, but they can kind of get an idea of how to deal with certain things. You know, now you're serving that purpose. Like, you're you're serving that mentor role, you know. I think the best thing a mentor told me was, don't be afraid to fail. And that's what I tell my kids, well, my co-workers and my I call them my kids so I'm just going to refer them yeah. as my kids but they're not my <laughs> children <laughs> I didn't I didn't birth them but um what I tell my kids is I learned a thousand ways not to do something yeah <laughs> you know that if you go in every day scared that you're gonna fail you're going to fail mm -hmm. you know and so I had a reporter once tell me oh my gosh, my camera is busted. My interview didn't show up. I have nothing. So back in the day, if you didn't have anything to report, you would get written up. You know, that's back in the day, back, back, back in the day. We're talking about my day, you know, that's that type. But now I'm like, okay, let's, let's evaluate. Okay. Because they have a deadline. They have to show up with their stories, yep. you know, filmed, written, interviewed, about to go in different shows by 1.30. I'm like, okay, it's noon. And they're scared to tell me. And I'm like, why are you scared? They're like, I don't want to, I don't want you to get mad. I'm like, I'm not gonna get mad. And I'm like, okay, let's 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 figure out the day. Okay, let's see what story there is that we can we can make it and you can aka front it, come out on camera. That's the wording, fronting. And so we figured out a way to do it. But again, there's we, we live in such an age that everyone's so afraid to fail. Yeah. And they're so afraid to risk it because they don't want to feel defeat. And my thing is just feel it. You know, you're regardless, regardless, you have to go in and say, okay, at least I know that this way didn't work. Let me try something else. And so that's what I tell my, my kids. I said, okay, it didn't work. Let's move on. Let's move on to the next, to the next. Well, it's because I want, let's talk about it after you, you come out on camera. 
you know, I already have a story for you. Let's talk about it at the end of the day. So, you know, they finish, they do their story, comes out at five, comes out at six, comes out at ten, and they're like, okay. They call him, they, some call me Miss Alex, some call me Alex, and they're like, okay, Miss Alex, can I talk to you about what happened today? I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. You know, let's go through it. And that's one thing that I tell the kids now. I'm like, if you start dwelling on it, then everything's going to set in. Then you're going to have some self-loathing type, yeah. you know, experience. Be like, no, 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 no. There's a solution. Let's, let's, let's look at it. And so I try to instill that in their mind. That yes, the day may not have been what you wanted. Your interview was not, you, you didn't, you didn't, what you had planned didn't go. But there's always, when there's a will, there's a way. And I learned that through a mentor. And he taught me to fail and how to get up and how not to dwell on it. And that's how you keep on moving forward. Is this something that you do on your own or is that, or is that part of your job though? Of like kind, kind of counseling them. When I started, I, I didn't have that. But when I went to Waco and um, I went to Waco and, and I went to other stations and I had this amazing, amazing mentor. And he was the one who took time and told me, you know, you are so obsessed with trying to make things perfect. You're so obsessed with everything, wanting to work at He's like, how do you feel today? And I remember I would just break down. I feel, you know, horrible. Like, my story is, everyone hates my voice. Everyone hates how I look. Apparently, my makeup's not good today. And he's like, okay, forget all that. How, what's your story about? What? He's like, yeah, what's your story? You're a storyteller. Let's talk about your story. So we focused a lot about the story. And I started, you know, the, the, the whole image part started fading away. Yeah. And so he taught me, you know, okay, it didn't work out. What else do you have? Let's just move on. And so I took that from him and I said, if I ever become a manager one day and I have kids, then I'm going to instill that. Obviously, I'm still, you know, like, hey, you need to have your stories in a certain yeah. amount of time, you know. But I don't do it as how we used to. It was taught to me back in the day before him. And it was like, OK, you don't have your story. You got to write up. And. That hurts. That hurts you. <laughs> you know, that not only does it hurt your day, it hurts your your morale. It hurts everything. And over time, I that's what I'm trying to avoid with my kids. And I've been very fortunate that a lot of them have gone on to become bigger and have gone to better markets. I always say I want you to be better than I could ever be. You know, I hope, I pray that you go to New York. I hope and pray that you yeah. go to Vegas. I hope and pray because your success is a reflection of, of me at the end of the day, you know? And so I, I teach them that way. I teach them to figure out other ways to do it because that's how I was taught. And it was because I made a ton of mistakes and, but you have to accept those mistakes and be like, okay, I messed up. How do I get up? And that's the whole process. Yeah. You know, and, and again, it gives you anxiety. It gives you panic attacks. It gives you all these things. But you have to know what your triggers are. And everyone has different triggers. Yeah. You know, some people, you know, they have to go to sleep early because if not the next day, you know, they're not <laughs> alert, you know. Yeah. Some people, you know, don't talk to an ex, you know, because if not, that <laughs> triggers them, you know. So you have to find your triggers and accept them and say, okay, if I'm going to speak to a, a room full of people or I'm going to be on live TV with thousands of eyeballs, what is it one thing that I'm not going to have? And so you just make sure you don't have them for the next day. But you have to, again, we go back to accepting it. It's funny because listening to you speak, you kind of, you it's like I'm talking to a teacher. <laughs> like you're describing basically a, like a, a teaching uh, job, but with, with television. <laughs> <laughs> no, my kids, my kids, I, and I learn a lot from them. And that's the thing. You have to, you have to learn from this new generation because there's things that I don't, I don't know. And they tell me, have you seen this from TikTok? I don't have TikTok. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I have no idea. I don't even have an iPhone. You know, I have an Android. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even get a smartphone till I had to work for TV news. I had a flip phone. And so you have to be willing to listen and, you know, you have to be able to evolve. And, and news is always evolving. The, hence the word yeah. news, new, you know? Yeah. You always have to be on top of things. But it contributes to all of that. 
So one of my last questions will be, you've reached a certain point mm -hmm. in your career. What are your goals now? I think, you know, it was funny because someone said, I, I, I was, I'm very obsessed with one thing in life right now. And it's always to accomplish these goals. When I, again, going back, when I was painfully, painfully shy, I made this, these t 10 goals of life. I wanted to be on radio, I wanted to be on TV, I wanted to meet presidents, I wanted to travel, you know, I had all these dreams, you know, and so I, I've, over, over the, the years, I've been able to scratch each one, I have one more in my bucket list, but, you know, I think that you never stop having goals, you, you should never have, you should never stop, because it puts a limit, mm -hmm. and you always have to aspire to do more. And so if I were to keep on doing it, I would be doing what I'm doing now, which is traveling, seeing new things, teaching people. That's what I hope I keep on doing. I, I never want to stop learning. I don't yeah. care if I'm 70 years mm -hmm. old. I never want to stop learning. I want to learn something new every day if I can. <laughs> Hence why I love where I work, because every day is somewhere new. It gave me the opportunity to see a window into someone else's life. If I want to be a firefighter for a day, well, I'm not going to, you know, put out a fire. <laughs> But uh, just seeing what they do is so, so beautiful to me. I can do that because yeah. of the job. You know, it gives me the experience to see that. If I want to, you know, talk to a veteran from Korea that's 95, I can because of my job. Yeah. You know, so I think for me, I never want to stop learning. After I've reached everything, I want to keep on reaching more until, until my body gives out and my mind gets tired and I'm not able to do it. But if, if I'm able and able body to do it i'm gonna keep on doing it <laughs> you know would you say that you kind of live vicariously through like the, the report the news that you you create or that you report oh absolutely oh my gosh i live vicari what a blessing to go in at work and see a different life every day you know i every day is some something new i learn something new all the time And sometimes it gets, uh, you know, people get a little tired of, about that. And sometimes they leave the business because they want something a little yeah. bit more stable. But I love being able to have the opportunity to do that. I've, I've been so blessed. Like, for example, I've been able to go to Camp Pendleton in, in San Diego and saw what Marines did for a week. I've been able to go to the Capitol floor. I've been able to interview presidents and presidential candidates. I've been able to interview people from different foreign wars, from World War II down. I've been able to go to a prison and 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 and, and speak to someone that's incarcerated. You know, so I have a window to a life that I will never know. Maybe I would hope not. <laughs> some some I hope not, but some that I'm like there's from i can't uh, history books don't do it justice sometimes there's things that i learned so i am very 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 blessed to be able to work in an industry where every day is different but also you have such an immense responsibility to make sure you tell the story right and you give it the justice that it deserves and the time that it deserves in what is it like 15 20 years you've been in, in the business mm -hmm. in all that time So you leave it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What would be that one memory that you have that is you're just gonna stick stick in your head? Oh my gosh, I, I think there are so many, but I can give you the top five. For me, one of the stories I did was about a woman who was her brother had passed away in an accident, and she was looking for the recipient of her brother's organ. The do organ donor, the the recipients of the yes. organs, mm -hmm. and so I took it very seriously because she wanted to see if there was any way to locate what had happened to her brother's heart. Her brother had passed away in a, a car accident, and so she didn't know for 20 years. And so, just between doing my daily reporting, you know, I would contact the organ uh, foundations, all these f foundations, and finally we were able to get in contact, you know, through that. That's one of the stories I will remember a lot because we were able to give her the closure she was looking for. The second story is I was reading this huge doc. I, I read a lot, but sometimes I read really random things. But I, I came across this article 
about this guy who was trying to appeal his conviction about aggravated robbery. And he had been sentenced to 25 years. And I said, man, wouldn't it be great to just talk to him? Wouldn't it just be great? Wouldn't it just be great to just reach out to him? And so we did. And um, I was able to go to the prison and, and interview him. And I did this all alone. And through our coverage at that time, this is where, when I was at another station. We were able to get, there was such a, there was such a spotlight to his story that he was able to have a retrial and he was eventually, his conviction was overturned. And we were so persistent about that. So that was maybe my second yeah. memory. <laughs> my third, my third memory I want to say is working with veterans in town, working with a lot of veterans. There's a lot of veterans that have been deported you know, no. and yeah. so working with them, working with a lot of them about telling their stories, it's fading away. You know, there a lot of them are passing. Yeah. And so one of the stories that I'm currently working on is a Korean War veteran. His remains have been found after 70 years. And so he's from Laredo and he's one of the six that is still in this plaza downtown or Jarvis Plaza. His name is there and he's been found and he's going to be coming home to be um he's going to be buried along with his mom on in October. So that's for sure one of the ones. And I guess just to kind of finish it off for me, my kids have always been something that I'm really proud of. You know, I've seen them become better reporters, better people, made differences. A lot of them have gone to bigger markets like Las Vegas. Some of them have been com- correspondents. One of them is working for AP News. You know, so the fact that they've been they've been able to become what they want to become or sometimes even getting out of the industry and just something bigger in media. That's, that's phenomenal to me. So if I were to leave tomorrow, I'm just so proud of those types of stories that I've been able to do to be able to help people using the power of TV and also my kids and being able to make them or help them guide them, telling them the mistakes I made so they don't make the same mistakes. That I mean, <laughs> those are a lot of. I, I would I would love to hear or watch those those uh, stories. I'll send them to you <laughs> because <laughs> they do sound really interesting. Um, that's that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>